Let me share this with you before we dive in, is that uh, Caleb and MK send their love and their wishes. They thank you for uh, those of you that helped uh, load their truck up and send them off. Uh, they were greeted by a great team uh, down in Irmo, South Carolina. They had 26 people to help unload a 26-foot truck, and they got it done in an hour. And so they, uh, they send their love and thanks to you and... Uh, they are excited today because it's their first service at their, at their new church. And so uh, be keeping them in your prayers and thoughts. And I tell you what, Vision Sunday last Sunday was just flat out awesome. Amen. And here's a reminder. Let me tell you this. Here's what the Lord put on my heart for this. And it, it's, it's relationship over religion. Okay. And what the Lord did was he gave us the, the woman at the well to help drive that home. And this whole year, everything we're going to do is going to kind of point towards that, drive towards that. And here's the thing. You may see relationship over religion on shirts. You may see it on hoodies. You may see it on hats. You may see it on cups. You may see a lot of that. So be on the lookout for that because truly that's what it is. Jesus crossed cultural, political, social boundaries so that this woman at the well who was a Samaritan whom society said you're not supposed to have any dealings with. You don't even talk to them. You don't go across that bridge. You get nowhere close. And Jesus said, yes, I do. And he did it. And he did it for you, and he did it for you, and he did it for you, and he did it for me. He did it so that we can have a right relationship with the Lord. And the challenge was for you to build relationships with people this year. And that's still the challenge. And you need to be praying, Lord, who can I build a relationship with in this room? Right here. In this room. It's about building relationship. And here's what it's going to take for all of us. It's going to take all of us being all obedient and all in. And the key word there is all. See, as a leader, I can't ask you to do anything if I'm not willing to do it. So I got to live it out. So I've got to be all in. I've got to be all obedient. And I know what you're saying there. Yeah, I'm all in. Are you really? Because when you look back, navigate, navigate your week and see where you're all in at. Okay? Have you made, I, I remember one of the, the uh, Pastor Will had, had a lot of, great sermons, but one of the ones that touched me the most was the, the sermon about making margin. Are you crafting room for God to work in your life, or is your margin filled up where you say, you give the Lord leftovers, and then he doesn't even get all of those? It's going to take all of us being all obedient and all in. And here's what I loved about last week, man. This was my takeaway, was this right here. What water pot do you need to leave behind 
so that you can build relationships with people in order to introduce them to Jesus because that's the goal. What do you need to leave behind? This woman that came to the well left one of the most valuable things in her life behind to go into the city and tell people about a man who told her everything about herself. What water pot do you need to leave behind? And I know what you're saying. Pastor Mike, I'm an introvert. I don't people a lot. Okay? I'm just going to tell you, you're going to have to push past that. Because Jesus pushed past the boundary to build a relationship with this woman. He did. He pushed past the boundary. And, and here's the thing. He, he did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for everybody. And don't look at barriers as an excuse. Barriers are opportunities to step up and step into what God has for you. That's what it is for you. Now, here's the thing. This is going to be natural for some of you. Some of you, man, you'll talk, you'll talk a horse into coming to church. Okay? And then for some of you, it's going to be difficult because it's going to be different. And can I tell you this? Did you see the number of new people at Encounter in 2023? It's okay to be different. Amen? It's okay if it's different. It's okay if it's challenging. It's okay if the Green Bay Packers are going to lose today. It's okay. I just seen a hat. <laughs> but here, here's the thing. It's okay to be different. It's okay if somebody looks different than you. It's okay if they dress different from you. It's okay if they even smell different from you. It's okay. It's going to be, here's the thing. You got to realize this is going to be uncomfortable. Because guess what? We don't like to people. And guess what? We are difficult. We're difficult to get along with. We're difficult to sit with. We're difficult to talk to. And here's the reality. You still got to build relationships. The call still stands. You got to build relationships. That's what it's about. So the compass has been set for encounter in 2024. Relationship over religion. So how do we start taking steps to get there? How do we start taking steps to get there? It's this relationship over religion, and here, here's where we're going to start at. We're going to be in a series for three weeks called Prayer Life. The one thing that believers and followers of Jesus Christ likely do the least, amen? And I'm not talking about, now nah, lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep, if I should die far awake, pray the Lord my soul, take amen. God is great, God is good, thank you for the Lord's food, amen. We got to get past that. We have to be intentional. We have to communicate because God wants to hear from his children. We're going to be in this series called Prayer Life. Prayer is so critical to the life of the church. We need to plan for prayer, and that's what we're going to do today. So here's what prayer is. Prayer is the soul approaching God. You need to get that. Prayer is equal to the soul approaching God. Approaching the creator of you, the creator of the universe, the, the captain of your salvation, because you are not. Amen? You are not the captain of your life. You don't get to dictate what you do. You don't get to set the compass. You don't get to do it. You don't get to do it. It's his way. It's always been his way. Jesus died for your sins and for mine so that we can approach a holy God. And we can have a relationship with a holy God. Because without Jesus, unholy can't commune with holy. Amen? We can't do that. And here's what I know about a praying church. A praying church is passionate about prayer. And prays for the advancement of the gospel. Amen? A praying church is passionate about prayer. I'm telling you, I remember some of the old time prayer meetings that my granddad used to have at Swinney Street, and then when I went to 10th Street and the late Dr. Herman Floyd, I remember some of them prayer meetings. And if we had some of them prayer meetings today, they would be the least attended event. Because here's what people would say, oh, I can't believe, it. there you go, there you go, brother so-and-so, he's going to be about 10 minutes. But really, when it, when I, I, and this is no disrespect 
But when they had prayer meeting, that's just what they had. We might have spent the hour in prayer. Amen? And that's okay. It's okay. It's, 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 we need to be passionate about it. Now, there's a lot. Anybody ever flown in here? Who likes flying? I do. I'd rather fly than drive any day. My wife didn't raise her hand. Y'all know something I'm trying to. That's why we got, we got to put miles on the car. But, but you know, I, I, I like a plane. I used to be scared of heights. I, I mean, I, I still am. But I like a plane. But you know what? There's a lot that goes into landing a plane. A pilot has to take into account, he's got to take into account altitude, he's got to take into account speed, he's got to take into account the size of the plane, the, the length of the plane, he's got to take into account the length of the runway. All of this t plays a part in a pilot landing a plane, right? It, it does. And here's the thing, think about this, typically the landing starts about the last 25 to 30 minutes of the flight. You'll hear the pilot say, we've now started our descent into Miami International Airport. That's just what I'm used to hearing when we go from Haiti to Miami. <laughs> but you know, it's typically the last 25 to 30 minutes of the flight. And here's the thing. A pilot cannot screw the landing up. I mean, it's just hard to do a touch and go in a 747. I've never seen it done. Now the F-16, F-18, they can touch and go. <laughs> But it is, it's hard to do a touch and go in a 747. You know the most dangerous time on a flight is the takeoff and the landing. It's not in between. It's the takeoff and the landing. I remember my first trip to Haiti, uh, the, uh, Pastor Wes Roberts, a great friend of mine who actually did my ordination service. And uh, we were in that plane and he was like, I was like, man, he said, it's okay, we're up with 33,000 feet. He said, hey, just remember, hey, if something happens to us up here, we're closer to home. It's like, that's not what I needed to hear. <laughs> and then he got to look at this. He follows that up with, hey, have you ever watched Final Destination? <laughs> it's like, dude, I'm done. I'm like, get, put X-Men on for me or something. <laughs> but I say that to say this right here. Planning for the approach is to have a pattern for prayer. We need a pattern to keep us on track. Okay, and here's the thing, before you think this, I'm not talking about the Lord's Prayer. Because I don't know that you and I are really ready for that to come to life. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Do we really want thy kingdom to come? Do we really want thy will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? I'm not talking about that. Okay, we need a pattern. To keep us on track. Exodus 25, 8 and 9 says this right here. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings just so you shall make it. And then in 1 Corinthians 3 and 16 it says this right here. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? See, we're going to look at this tabernacle pattern. And here's what you got to realize. The tabernacle is important in this time because that's, that's where the, the, the men of God would go and they would meet with God. This, this tabernacle, this tent of meeting, this dwelling among us. See, the sanctuary in the temple, it was holy. It was set apart. And it was a special place. And what I love uh, about the tabernacle here is, is you got to realize it's the, 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 the portable nature of it proves that God wanted to be with his people as they traveled. He always wanted to be with his people as they traveled. And what this does is this tabernacle also points to the atonement that would eventually happen through Jesus Christ. This tabernacle, this tent of meeting, this place of dwelling with God, it's holy, it's set apart. 
And in your life, what have you set apart for God? What have you set aside? Have you set aside time that says, Lord, I'm not going to be interrupted by anything. I mean, turn the phone off, turn the TV off, turn it all off. Do you have a holy time and a holy place that is set apart for you and the Lord in your life? This tabernacle was important. And then when you look at that scripture in 1 Corinthians, Paul wanted them to know that they were a unified assembly. This is not talking about an individual Christian. This is talking about a unified body. The emphasis of the temple here is on the church as a whole, not as an individual. And you know, people always say, man, I I love the book of Acts, one of my favorite books. Because you see the movement of the church, and you see people responding, you see the Lord growing people, and you see the numbers just being added daily, and people say, man, I wish I could see that. You want to see a move of the Holy Spirit like the book of Acts? Be unified. Amen? Be unified body. Be unified in heart. Be unified in mind. Be unified... In the spirit. You want to know what makes a temple? You want to know what what makes the church a temple? It tells us there the spirit of God dwells in you. That's the place where God dwells. That's a temple. That's what makes the church a temple. Psalms 104 says this right here. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. We can already take a look at this whole tabernacle pattern. And then what you're going to get is you're going to get some different pieces of the tabernacle, and that's your homework. You get to go home and, and, and kind of dig into this. Because here's the thing, I, I challenge you with, with Whatever message is preached by whomever is up here, I challenge you to take that all week and say, okay, Lord, you gave this to Pastor Mike. What are you giving me? And and so we get here in Psalms, and we know that this is a psalm of thanksgiving. You can see this. Look at it. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. There's a lot of action there. And with praise. This thanksgiving is, is, do you willfully and joyfully come to the Lord? with praise and thanksgiving, no matter the circumstance, okay? Because he's not a circumstantial God, amen? And I'm glad he's not, because if he was a circumstantial God, whoo-wee, we'd be in trouble. Enter into his courts with thanksgiving. Are you one who is just going through the motions? Eh, let me do it. God is great. God is good. Amen. Thank you for the Lord's food. Maybe you one that's had a recent disagreement with somebody in the church. Can I tell you, it's okay to be different. We can agree to disagree. Amen. But the truth is the truth. It stands. This is the truth. This psalm is basically telling us that you got to get outside your normal life. Amen. We got to quit living normal and we got to remember God's goodness and God's dependability because you enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise see you come through those doors whatever I mean let lay it at the foot of the cross and leave it enter into his gates with thanksgiving and with praise and then what's guess what it says also guess what we're to do be thankful man I'm thankful I got the breath of life this morning and we take that for granted Try going to a place and and living in a place where they don't have electric all day. It's not up to them. It's up to the power plant, whether they're going to have it or not. Try having no clean water. I I mean, I've I've been to Haiti umpteen times, and it's, you remember old cisterns on top of houses? That's how they get water. Try being in a shower and being all soaked up and lathered up and then realize the cistern's empty. Whew. And it's just, it's these things we, we, we take for granted. And it says, be thankful to him. Not only are we to be thankful, church, but we're to bless. You know how we can bless God? By being obedient to him. Amen. You know how else we can bless God? By loving his people. Amen. Be a blessing. Loving people. So what's the first thing about this tabernacle pattern? It's this right here. Enter into fellowship with God. What part of the tabernacle? That's the gate. The gate. You're going to write the gate out to the side of that. 
enter into fellowship with God. Because before you and I can enter into fellowship with anybody else, if this fellowship isn't right right here, these won't be right. Amen? It won't be aligned. Enter into fellowship with the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19 says this right here, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct, received by your tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Great scripture right here. Great scripture that really kind of sets the tone. This is a solid reminder, and this is an unshakable truth located here. Knowing that you were not, notice that you were not redeemed with what? Corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your father. You are not saved by those things that you keep and you're not redeemed by those things that you keep putting all your time and all your money and all your effort and all your talents into. You're not redeemed by those things. Amen? It's not. And we do. We spend a lot of aimless time on things that in the grand scheme of it won't matter. Amen? We're to build one another up. We're to love one another. We're to help bear one another burdens. Like you're not saved by those things. It's not anything that you or I have ever done that we earn redemption. Amen? It's a gift. It's a gift. And I think there's a lot of people, even in the church and outside the church, that think, well, yep, I went to prayer meeting today. I went to community group. Let me check that off. I went to the best 1010 yet. Let me check that off. It's not about that. It's not anything that you or I have done, but it's all about what he's done. Amen? And what he's accomplished in the way that he's done it. Our redemption is not from anything of this world, and he says it right there, but the precious blood of Christ. That's where your redemption is. That's where it comes from. God redeemed us from sin. Amen? He didn't have to. He chose to. He redeemed us. You know, a slave was usually reclaimed or redeemed when, when someone paid the price to free them from slavery. They'd give a certain amount of money. But see, God redeemed us, and it wasn't with money. It was with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about your redemption. Think about your being able to have a relationship with the Lord. It's with the precious blood of his own son. You and I cannot escape this life. You and I cannot escape sin in this life. We're sinful people. Amen. And we have a sin nature about us. The only one who can free us from sin is Jesus. Amen. And I'm, I'm saying those, those are the programs and things that people <laughs> have in place to help an addict of any kind, those are great. But you know what even starts before? They got to want it in here before they can even start a 12 step. Amen. Because you'll get to the 12 step and then the 13th you're back at the first. It's our only Jesus can free you. That's where real freedom is found. So guess what the second thing is about this tabernacle pattern? We need to rest in Christ's work on the cross. You need to rest in that. Now, there's not many things I can tell you to take to the bank and bank on it, but that right there is 100% that you can rest in his work on the cross. And that right there, what part of the tabernacle was that? That's the brazen altar. You need to rest in Christ's work. It's not anything you've done. It's not anything Encounter's done. It's not anything that Pastor Mike's done. It's not anything that anybody's done. But it's everything that he's done and who he is. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27 says this right here, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Man, that sounds like, whoo, how, how do we get that? 
But I, I love this here, that, that he might sanctify and cleanse. Who sanctifies? Him. Who cleanses? Him. By the washing of water by what? By the word. By the core values of encounter? No. By you checking every box? No. By you claiming to be, well, I've been a good Christian this week? No. By the word. By the word and by the word only. And no spot or no wrinkle. Who does that? Amen. Jesus Christ. Because he's coming back for his church. Amen. That's one thing we know for sure. We can go a lot of different directions, but here's what we know for sure. He's coming back. Amen. He is coming back. And he's coming back for his church. He cleanses us from the old ways of sin and sets you and I apart for sacred service. Amen. He's the only one that can cleanse us. And Christ cleanses the church by the washing of baptism. That's why I love it. You know, a, a, a Middle, Middle Eastern bride, she would have a, there would be a ceremonial cleansing, there would be a ceremonial bath before she would get married. And, and for us today, you say, well, what, how does that apply? It, it's God's word that cleanses you and I today. Amen. That's his word. It's his way. It's his purpose. So what's another part of the tabernacle pattern? It's this right here. You need to submit to God's purifying word. It's God's word purifying cleanses. He just said it sanctifies and it cleanses us. We need to submit to that. We're talking about planning for the approach is, is to have a pattern for prayer and we're trying to get this in. This is you need to submit to God's purifying word. In that tabernacle, that's the laver. L-A-V-E-R. Look at this, Leviticus chapter 24. One and two says this, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light. To make the lamps burn continuously. Hmm. Isaiah 11 and 2 says this right here. It says, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And I know what you're saying. Oh, Pastor Mike, where's this going? The lamps in this tabernacle are very important. Because here's why they're important. That's the only light in the tabernacle. Okay? That's the only light. They're very important. Those lamps, and guess what they stood on? Solid gold lampstands. Man. I ain't talking about like solid gold back in the days. Y'all dancing, busting out your dance moves. Solid gold lampstands. These lamps stood on solid gold lampstands. These lamps were the only source of light in the tabernacle. And, and by this scripture, we can see that you had to take great care of them. They're precious. And you just couldn't put any kind of oil in them. Pure oil. Pressed of olives. <laughs> they had to have special care. Not any kind of oil, but pure oil. Guess what you would also have to do to these lamps? The, the, the wicks would have to be trimmed. Why does all that matter? Because it's the only light in the tabernacle. And then when you look at Isaiah 11 and 2, look at, look at what being a child of God consists of. To name a few, look at it. There's wisdom. There's understanding. There's counsel. There's might. There's knowledge. There's fear of the Lord. Not a fear as in afraid of, but a fear as in awe. I'm in awe of the Lord. The empowerment of the Messiah is unmatched. That's how you and I can navigate this thing. That's how we can do this thing called life. You want to know another step in the pattern? Is this right here. Seek the Lord for wisdom and understanding. Seek him first. Scripture says, seek ye first what? The kingdom. Not seek ye first encounter. 
Not seek ye first Pleasant Valley, not seek ye first New Life, not seek ye first Redemption Place, not seek ye first Orangeboro Christian, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek the Lord for wisdom and understanding. A lot of times, and you want, what does this stand for in that tabernacle? That's the golden lampstand. These are all furnishings. Seek first the Lord for wisdom and understanding. A lot of times, here's what a lot of us do. We go to, we'll seek Google. Amen. I don't care what, what searching, you know, Safari, whatever you want you, but we do. But would you just stop and pause and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, where do you want to lead me? And I pro- uh, Ed talked about it this morning in the 930 meeting, man. When you talk and you commune with the Lord, the Lord will lead you. The Lord may lead you to brother so-and-so. He may lead you to sister so-and-so. He may lead you here and he may lead you there. But a lot of times we don't get the answers because we don't consult the right source. Amen. Let's talk to him. Let's seek him for wisdom. And for understanding, 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says this, For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. That word partake is huge here. It's the the same word used for communion, koinonia, communion. Y'all don't hear me use big words very much. They're hard to pronounce. (laughs) No. But it is, it's, it's this thing about communion. And you've got to realize, back in biblical times, it was a big deal for you to go to somebody's house and to sit at the table with them and to eat. That was a big deal. It really didn't, and here's the thing. If you did that, that means there was a deep level of friendship. There was a deep level of trust. And you'll say, well, how does that relate to us today? You don't just invite anybody to your house, amen? Because here's what I can tell you. Now, here's, here's, you, you, you might amen that or you might hallelujah this and that, but I want you to amen this too. How you going to invite somebody to a table that you don't even sit down and eat at? Ooh, wee. Boy, you walking heavy, Right? Sometimes you, you, you and your family don't even sit down and eat at the table. So how are you going to invite a guest? It was big in those days for you to sit, like to sit at the table, eat the same meal at the same table with the people. You know what we do today? I'm guilty of it. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not talking at you. I'm talking with you. Because we got busy lives, right? You know. That's why I need all the, it just, slow down a little bit. Amen, slow down. Sit down, enjoy life a little bit. Here's what you need to do. What does this kind of show us a, another pattern for prayer? Is this right here. You need to pray for the spiritual welfare of fellow believers. You need to pray for the well-being of other people. Amen. And preferably, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because this life isn't all about you. A lot of time we go to the Lord and we pray and we go, yep. I want this. Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this. And then we'll say, amen. We don't even want to listen. Right? That's what we do. Pray for the spiritual welfare of fellow believers. What what, what furnishing is that in the tabernacle? That's the table of showbread. You need to pray for the welfare of other people. You need to pray for their well-being. Now, Revelation 8, 3 through 5 says this right here. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. You know what you say? Here we go, Pastor Mike done got deep. Well, we're getting in Revelation. We're going to be another hour. No, t- no, it's not a great book here. Now, this censer filled with live coals was used in temple worship. And guess what would happen? The incense would be poured over. Okay, incense would be poured over, and guess what would happen? Smoke, 
would rise, and it was usually this sweet-smelling aroma. It, it, it drifted upward, symbolizing a believer's prayers going up to God. That's all this is. And that you, can, you can see that in, in I believe it's uh, Exodus chapter 30, if you want to check me. You can see that, Exodus chapter 30. Now, here's what happens. This angel throws his censer down on the earth. And guess what this looks at? Guess what this means? This symbolizes the judgment of God restored upon the earth. It was in answer to the prayers of the saints. For justice for those who had oppressed them and killed them. That's what this is. When he throws it down upon the earth, this shows that the, here's what you got to realize. The judgment, revenge, and vindication is the Lord's. Amen? It's not yours. Scripture even says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. It's his. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to you and I. You don't get to be about revenge. You don't get to have vindication. It's all his. Those who oppressed them and killed them, it was a response to their prayers. And you know what? Here's, here's, here's another tabernacle pattern is this right here. You need to worship God with the faith that he receives your prayers. God receives your prayers, and here's what I know. God answers prayers. Amen. Now, God may not answer them the way you want it, because a lot of times we speak a prayer, and we're already giving God the answer we want. Amen. We do that a lot. And can I tell you this right here? No matter how strong our desire is to exact revenge and retaliate on our enemies, our work is to pray, asking God for his justice to be done. God's justice. Not yours, not the world's, not what you think is right, not what you think is equal, but God's justice. That's our work is to pray that his justice would be done. First Timothy chapter 2, 1 and 2, we're winding down. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving thanks be made for all men, for kings who are all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. you got to realize this here. What is spoken of here is to be made for all men. And you might say, well, Pastor Mike, why is that so critical? That is astounding. Because you got to realize who's king at this time. See, there's this king named Nero. And Nero was cruel. Nero was a cruel king. I mean, he did some unimaginable things. You remember the fire that destroyed Rome, A.D. 64? Nero had to have a scapegoat, and guess who he blamed? Roman Christians. He blamed Roman Christians for the fire. And then here's what he did. The, the, the Roman Christians, they were denied certain privileges in society. Amen? Ain't there certain things? That, I mean, the term Christian is just not as strong as it used to be. It used to have a lot of validity and strength behind it. Now it's soft. Amen. It don't hold up like it used to be. Some Christians, get this, in Nero's time, they were publicly butchered. They were burned. They were even fed to animals. And you realize that he's saying right here, this request be made for all men. We're talking about supplication. That is simply you asking for something. Supplication talking about prayers, that's in general your communication with God. Then he talks about intercession. That is you asking for something on behalf of others. And then giving thanks. If you lack gratitude, you lack a fundamental basic of Christianity. To have some gratitude. And I know this right here. We need to rejoice that God has made himself accessible and make intercession on behalf of others. That's another part of the tabernacle pattern. What is that? That's the Ark of the Covenant. You need to realize that. You need to see that, that, that God has made himself accessible. And see, this life is not just about you. And it's about others. Ephesians 6 and 18, as we get ready to close out, praying always with all prayer and supplication and the Spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all the saints. All prayer, all supplication in the spirit, watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication 
by all the saints. That word all there is key. Encounter. We have planned the approach. Let's make the approach now. See, when, it, when, it, when that plane hits a certain altitude, it's got to start its descent. We've, we've, we've made the plan. We've planned the approach. Let's make the approach now. And it's this right here. I love acronyms as we close this out. ACTS. A-C-T-S. For some of y'all students, don't get scared. I'm not talking about the A-C-T. Okay? ACTS. And this is critical. The first thing we need to do in respect to prayers is we need to adore him. Amen? You need to adore him. Do you adore the creator of the universe, the savior of your soul, the one who died for you? Do you adore him? And then here's what else you need to do. You need to confess sins. Right? Because there's times, if we're honest with each other, there's times that we failed the Lord all week. Amen? But I know a just and a forgiving God. And he's faithful and just to forgive you. You know what here's else you need to have in Acts? You need to have some thanksgiving. Have some gratitude. Have some gratitude. Be thankful that the Lord didn't give you some things that you asked for. Amen? Be thankful that he didn't let you travel down a road that you wanted to go. Be thankful that his way is better than your way. And here's what else you need to have. Some supplication. You need to talk to him. You need to ask him. And it starts with our prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that, Father, if we're going to be a people that's about relationship over religion, we need to pray, Lord, that you would undo us. Father, that you would remove any hindrances, that you would remove any roadblocks, that you would remove any excuses that we may have. Father, that we may bridge the gap, that we may walk across unknown and unseen with you leading the way and build relationships with your people all for your kingdom and for your glory. Father, it's in your name we pray.